Episode 43, Tech Investor, Musician, and Activist, Roger McNamee. Welcome to The Art of Excellence, a show about people doing extraordinary things in their lives. I'm your host, Glenn Zweig. Thanks for joining me. My guest today is Roger McNamee. Roger has been a successful Silicon Valley investor for 35 years. He co-founded Silver Lake and Elevation Partners, two extraordinarily successful private equity funds. He also plays bass and guitar in the bands Moon Alice and Doobie Decimal System. He holds a BA from Yale and an MBA from Dartmouth's Tuck School. He has written four books, the latest one titled Zucked, Waking Up to the Facebook Catastrophe. Roger, welcome to the show. It's great to be here. So did you always want to be an investor? Like, was that your North Star from a very young age? I never even considered it until I was in graduate school. It never occurred to me. I didn't realize you could get paid to do what I wound up doing as a career. And I was a late bloomer and stumbled onto it by a series of remarkable coincidences. Well, what did you think you wanted to do? Well, to be clear, as a child, I had very little ambition in the sense that we think of today where kids are almost wired you know, into some profession from birth and you know, like Tiger Woods. My parents had a view that each child in their very large family should find his or her own way. And their goal was to give them a good education and a lot of encouragement, but to let them make the choices. And in my case, that took a while. I mean, you're obviously very highly educated. Clearly, you had a lot of drive and ambition. It was more of a journey than, you know, some destination you had in mind, it sounds like. I think that's right. I really was incredibly fortunate both in my choice of parents and in the circumstances of my childhood that allowed me to overcome a bunch of medical conditions and to become a person who was immensely curious. And then by a series of lovely accidents wound up being exposed to the wonders of digital technology in the earliest days of personal computers. And for whatever reason, I hooked onto that and it turned out I was not destined to be an engineer. I tried. I took a lot of electrical engineering courses, but I just was terrible at it. And the investment business was a path towards being around the world of digital technology as it came of age. So you were drawn to technology from the, the inception, right? We're talking sort of back during the early days of the PC. and So we're talking beginning in 1978. I, so the backstory in this was that I had taken a year off from college after sophomore year, and no sooner did I depart than my father got mortally ill and died soon thereafter. And I was stranded without a college degree and without the means to go back to college. So I worked for two and a half years in sales and earned enough money to return and finish my college education. And on my way back in Christmas time, 1978, my brother gave me a Texas Instruments speak and spell, which was this brand new idea for kids to teach them how to spell. It had a little screen, it talked to you, it said the words out loud and it had a keyboard. My brother said, if they can make this and sell it for whatever it was, 90 bucks, that means pretty soon you're gonna be able to make a handheld device that holds all your personal information. This was such an astonishing thing to say because the IBM PC was still three years away. I mean, the Apple II was a brand new product. And the Palm Pilot, which was the thing he was talking about, was like 18 or 19 years away. And so I'm sitting there looking at this thing, and I just got fixated on it. And I spent the next year trying to make prototypes, just really large, not handheld at all, but just huge. Just Could I make an organizer? I was such a bad engineer, I couldn't even get him to work. And so that's when I realized if I want to be around that, I have to find another path. So it's sort of fascinating to me that you know, you're so passionate about playing music. I'm sure it must be a really creative outlet for you. I think many people, maybe myself included, sort of think of investing as this highly analytical left brain activity. 
but I'm wondering if you view investing as much art as it is science. I view investing in my particular case as an accidental profession. I do not have the personality you normally associate with research analysts or portfolio managers. And I had a unique set of personality traits that when applied to the early days of digital technology were incredibly valuable. But I more or less reinvented the job of being an investment analyst to suit my skills. So I wasn't the kind of person who was comfortable sitting in an office making a really detailed spreadsheet. My gift was to travel around with the industry with my guitar. It was an industry where everybody was my age. We liked the same kind of music. And it happened that the people who were the movers and shakers in the 80s and PCs liked to have jam sessions. And the fact that I knew hundreds of songs made me incredibly popular. So I wound up evolving a style of investing that was based on analyzing products and becoming an expert on what sorts of things customers would want. Because I learned that earnings models are only useful in relatively mature businesses. And once as revolutionary as personal computers, if a product was hot, whatever the estimate was that the model gave would always be too low. And of course, the product wasn't hot, the estimate would be too high. So all you really needed to know was, was the product going to be hot? And it happened that when I came along, people didn't invest that way. And so I was able to evolve this very unusual style that allowed me to be successful at a time when tech was struggling to compete, you know, against all the other sectors that were succeeding in the early days of the bull market of the 80s. I want to talk about this last uh, investment fund that you co-founded, Elevation Partners. You choose Bondo as one of your co-investors there. And I, I think the world of the guy, I'm sure <laughs> he's got you know, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of fans, of course, around the world. You know, private equity investor isn't one of the obvious things that pops in my head, but clearly there must have been a reason why you went down that path. So what, what was behind that? What's the story there? So the story is that I was involved in a firm called Silver Lake Partners that I had co-founded. And Silver Lake had an opportunity to buy 18% of Apple when the stock was down in the dumps. It was literally trading at a stock price that was equal to the amount of cash in the balance sheet. And Steve Jobs gave me a chance to invest up to 18% of the company in the public market to go on the board. My partners turned it down. At the same time, Bono brought me an opportunity to take his record label, Universal Music Group, private. And my partners said they were willing to go along with that deal, but they didn't want me to be involved. That They had realized that, that the fund had succeeded so well, they no longer needed me. And so, their view was that they would go on without me. And I never stay where I'm not wanted, so I quit. And it happened I was in New York the day I quit, and I called Bono up to say, hey, I can't do the deal because I quit. And he said, you know, screw them, we'll start our own investment fund. And so Elevation was actually his idea. And it started the exact day that I resigned from, from Silver Lake. And you're, you're actually wrong about Bono. He was an extraordinarily valuable partner. Keep in mind, we only had him one day a week. But in that one day, Bono could contribute things that no one else had ever contributed to an investment fund. Think about the following thing. If you're investing in relatively new companies at the intersection of technology and media, who would they most like to be like? From a marketing point of view, what is the magic they're looking for? Do you know what it is? Like you said earlier, you approach the investment business through a, a different lens. Everyone else is doing these spreadsheets and very analytical, and you're sort of coming saying, I want to understand consumer behavior. I want to understand products. And so Bono's bringing the marketing aspect to that. So like, in other words, you saw something in terms of what he could contribute to investment returns that probably a traditional investor wouldn't necessarily give all that credit to. It was really funny. Yeah. Frank Caulfield, my dear friend and one of the original partners of Kleiner Perkins, Caulfield Myers, when I told him I was going to do a fund with Bono Roger, why Bono? There are all these other great people that other people can get or that you can get. You know, why not Mick Jagger? And I go, well, I don't know Mick Jagger, and I really do know Bono, and I think Bono would be really good at this. The point that you're making is at least a little bit true, which is that I do have a different approach. And the thing is that Bono, he'd been part of a partnership. You two at that point was, I don't know, 25 years old? He'd had to deal with the personalities and the stresses and strains of the partnership. And he was extraordinarily into 
the mechanics of running the firm. And he loved fundraising. He insisted on meeting every investor before the fund was closed. Obviously, you can imagine that was a draw to the investors as well. But the thing, they universally came out of there convinced that he was going to be a big value add to what we were doing. And in retrospect, that was completely true. It's a fascinating story. So I want to fast forward to Mark Zuckerberg. And it seems that your relationship started with a one-on-one meeting at your offices at Elevation back in 2006. Uh, You weren't given too much color going into this meeting other than Mark wanting to meet with you. But you had some sort of sixth sense, I guess, that there was something on his mind. Take me back to the room. When Mark first came to see me, he had just had his 22nd birthday. Facebook had only 9 million users. They were all high school students and college students. There was no news feed yet. I was already convinced that Facebook was going to be the next big thing and that it would be bigger at some point than Google was at that time, which is to say an enormous success. And I was convinced of that because they required authenticated identity in the form of your school email. And I was convinced that the reason that every prior social network had failed was because they got overrun by bullies and bad actors who used anonymity as a shield and then basically made all social spaces uninhabitable. So I was really excited to meet Mark. I was given no information to understand. He comes to my office and you know what? He looked just like Mark Zuckerberg. He's got the sandals. He's got the skinny jeans, the t-shirt, the hoodie, the courier bag. And I say, Mark, before you say anything, you got to give me two minutes so you understand why I took this meeting. Because once you start talking, you're going to assume anything I say is affected by that. He says, go ahead. Say, Mark, if it hasn't already happened, either Microsoft or Yahoo is going to offer a billion dollars for Facebook. Everybody you know, your mom and dad, your board of directors, your, your management team, your employees, your friends, everybody's going to say, Mark, take the money. It's a billion dollars. You'll have $650 million. You'll be able to change the world. We'll be rich. And your venture guy is going to say, Mark, I'll back your next company. It'll be way more successful than Facebook. And I said, Mark, I know two things that I've learned in 24 years as an investor. The first is there has never in the history of Silicon Valley been an entrepreneur who had the perfect idea at the perfect time twice. Not Steve Jobs, not anybody. It won't happen to you. The second thing I know is that I don't care who buys Facebook. They're going to screw it up. This is your baby. If this is going to work, you have to carry your vision through to completion. So I hope you don't sell the company. What followed was unbelievable. Literally five minutes of dead silence. It was so painful. I could barely contain myself. But I also really respected Mark because it was so obvious that he was taking what I said so seriously. I mean, I've, if you've ever been in a room with dead air for 15 seconds, you know how painful that can be. It, it, it almost five minutes, it was, it was literally a form of torture and violation of the Geneva Convention. But finally, he relaxes and he goes, you won't believe this. But that story you just told, that's why I'm here. That exact thing has just happened. You got every detail right. How did you know? And of course, I said, Mark, I didn't know. I just know all these people. And this is how Silicon Valley works. Anyway, it turns out he didn't want to sell the company. But he couldn't run it by himself. And everybody else wanted to sell. So I explained to him, when you're in that situation, you have plenty of capital. Your business is growing like crazy. That other people are not allowed to tell you the game's over. And I gave him the the lines he was supposed to use to calm them all down and make them all feel good about joining into the the rest of the journey that they had signed up for. And he left my office probably half an hour after he got there. And that was the beginning of a three-year period where I was one of his mentors. It's a crazy, crazy story. But, but I want to sort of play devil's advocate here just on, on one dimension. So, you know, I've had a past life in Silicon Valley. I've seen a lot of these companies come and go. There are so many of these stories where someone is on top of the world and everyone's saying, you know, don't sell, don't sell, right? You're going to conquer the world. Why settle? And you can count the companies on one hand 
that decided to not take the the buyout offer, go it alone. I mean, Google, you know, uh, could have sold and they didn't. And obviously Facebook here and you've got uh, Snap. I mean, right, there's a small number, but probably 99% of them, something happens, market correction, they run out of steam, they never get to uh, the mass market, don't cross the chasm, if you will. And uh, next thing you know, it's, uh, you know, it's history. And in hindsight, it was a really stupid move. So in this case, it was brilliant advice. And, and thank God that he heeded your advice. But uh, that was a pretty risky move that he did. Well, to be clear, I wasn't expecting the success to be as great as they have had. I was expecting the company to be as successful as Google was at that time, which would have been something like 100 million active users. Okay. And I think low tens of millions in revenue maybe an upside of 10, sorry, billion in revenue. Okay, you didn't see the, the ubiquitous Facebook that we have today that sort of owns 2 billion users or whatever it is. No, yeah. and in fact, as late as, as, late as I think uh, 2009, when he told me he was going for a billion users and the company might've had, I don't know, 300 million at the time, I told him I was worried that at a billion users, he'd have to be doing business in places or under terms that he should try his best not to do. And, you know, so to be clear about this thing, I was convinced that Facebook was the one in this category. And again, there's a spider sense that goes into that. And, you know, I've historically trusted my judgment on this, but let us be clear. I did not talk Mark into anything. What I did was I was a lone voice supporting his instinct, not realizing that that's what the question was, or that that was what his instinct was. I was merely letting him know what kind of a person I was. So I get what you saw on Facebook, because you know early stage investing is probably 90% the entrepreneur, 10% anything else, right? Everything can pretty much be replicated. So like, what did you see in Mark, him as an entrepreneur that you found so compelling? Well, the notion that he would take almost five minutes to respond was so unusual. I'd never experienced anything remotely like that. Listening is so unusual as a character trait in Silicon Valley entrepreneurs. Deliberation is not as widespread an idea as you would think. You know, many of them just have an e-day fix that they can't let go of. And in Mark's case, he definitely had this goal that he never let go of. But in those early days, there was a lot of uncertainty about how to get there. And he was extremely open to input. And I liked him a lot. And the thing that I would say to you here is that it was not crazy for him to say no to a billion dollars from Yahoo. That almost certainly, if he completed that year, it would be worth more to somebody else. Now, as it turned out, there were several other offers that followed the Yahoo one, all of which he turned down. The thing that you just have to remember is he went from zero to nine million users in basically two years with almost no expenditure. This was something that was growing without any effort. And businesses like that are incredibly unusual. It was so viral and so compelling for the demographic that used it that I just feel like Mark, he he found the holy grail. And so did you. Well, to be clear, when I met him, there was no opportunity to invest. Oh, it was later on that he came and invited it, it was Yeah, it was more than a year later that I got a chance to invest. When I first met him, that wasn't an issue at all. I just wanted to meet this kid because I thought this thing was the next big thing. And it's not every day you meet the next big thing. Well, I think we all know how the story unfolds with, with Facebook. So I want to fast forward the movie uh, about a decade or so. And you're no longer involved in the company. Uh, you're no longer mentoring Mark. You started to sense something was awry at the company, something that you were seeing, something that you were hearing, something maybe in your gut that uh, didn't sit so well. So w- what was that, Roger? There were signs all the way through that things were not entirely perfect at Facebook. It wasn't until I retired at the end of 2015 that I could begin to see clearly that there was something deeply and structurally wrong. Early in 2016, January, the Democratic primary, I saw things going on in Facebook groups that were inauthentic. 
Then in March, I saw Facebook expel the corporation for using the advertising tools to gather data on anyone who expressed an interest in Black Lives Matter. They were selling those identities to police departments in violation of people's civil rights. I thought that was really evil. Then in June, the United Kingdom had the referendum on leaving the European Union. That was the first time that I saw that Facebook's advertising tools could be used to essentially undermine democracy. Across that summer, I tried to find people who were looking at the problem to see if there was, were any allies, and I couldn't find any. And it got weirder and weirder. In September, I was invited to write an opinion piece for a tech blog called Recode. And I was working on that when we got the news that the Russians were actively interfering in our election. And that was when I realized I had to reach out to Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg, my friends, my former mentees, and share my concerns that there was something about the business model and algorithms of Facebook that allowed bad actors to harm innocent people. And I gave him a whole bunch of examples, including two really big ones in civil rights, two related to elections that were not the U.S. election. Because keep in mind, I reached out to them nine days before the U.S. election in 2016. So I wasn't even thinking about that outcome being affected. So if you think about a lot of the defense mechanisms that these companies use to disclaim responsibility, you know, it's something to the effect of, look, we're, we're just a platform. We don't control the content. It's others' content. There's publishers of content, there's uh, receivers of the content, and we just sort of provide a platform to allow the two to exchange. So is that just a BS sort of argument? I mean, is there any validity to that at all? Well, it's demonstrably true that the law says that they are platforms, not media companies, which means ostensibly that they're not accountable for the actions of third parties. The problem with that argument is that they do actively control the content that flows through the users. They have algorithms, they have rules, they make choices about what each person sees. And in that co context, they are clearly media companies. And my point was that even if there is a law that says you're not responsible for third parties, they were required to defend the well-being of the people who use Facebook. That if there was election interference or civil rights violations, that it was completely reasonable for people to get amazingly angry at them. And that if Facebook lost the trust of its users, it would be impossible to rebuild. And that the product was not essential to life. It was kind of a fun thing for people to do. And so they needed to be really, really careful. So my advice to them was, particularly after the election in 2016, I said, you should do what Johnson & Johnson did in 1982 when somebody put poison in some bottles of Tylenol in Chicago, Illinois. The CEO of Johnson & Johnson didn't say, hey, we didn't put the poison in. He leapt to the defense of his customers and withdrew every bottle of Tylenol from every retail shelf and didn't put it back until he'd invented tamper-proof packaging. And I said, that's the right thing to do here. It was a fantastic example of leadership at its best, right? Because the reality is they had nothing to do with it. But rather than disclaim, they stood up and said, we're taking responsibility. That move you're talking about, that cost them, I think, billions of dollars. It was a really, really big deal. And in the long run, it ended up rebuilding the trust they had maybe temporarily lost because of their wanting to do the right thing for the consumer. I, I love that example. you gave. It, it was a short run hit for a gigantic long-term benefit. And if you think about it, this is what Boeing should have done with the 737 MAX, that there are situations where the consumer has every right to hold the company responsible, even if the law does not. And I was convinced this was one of those cases for Facebook. And I spent three months privately pushing them to do the right thing. And it wasn't until after those three months that I realized they're never going to change. They just don't believe this applies to them. And it was such a disheartening thing. I can't overstate how depressing it was. This company I was so proud of. And to me, it was really cut and dry. And yet they didn't see it that way. And obviously, they were in charge. I wasn't. So they won that battle. But I was afraid they would lose the war. And it was at that point I was faced with the choice of, do I go back into retirement or do I personally take responsibility for the role I played in this? 
So do you think they knew they were in the wrong and didn't care? Or do you think they didn't necessarily see things the same way? Well, they for sure didn't see things the same way. And I suspect, at least initially, they misinterpreted what was going on. I can't be certain exactly when they knew that the Russians had used Facebook to interfere in the election. It was certainly by the middle of 2017. But it, it's quite possible that I was the first person to raise those kinds of suspicions with them. There's a famous piece of video. Mark was at a conference called Techonomy the day after the election in 2016. And he famously said, and I think this is a quote, it's crazy, unquote, to imagine that Facebook had influenced the outcome of the election. And it turned out it wasn't crazy. And therein lies the entire problem that from their frame of reference, they couldn't see that it was possible for that to occur. And so they chose to pretend like there was nothing to see and therefore nothing to investigate. I feel really bad for Mark and Cheryl because they got trapped in a way of thinking that is really a product of a culture that their entire professional careers have been involved in. I mean, think about U.S. business. We live in a world where we now prioritize shareholders over absolutely everyone else. We no longer care about employees in business. They no longer care about the communities where employees live. They don't care about customers. They don't care about suppliers. I mean, they'll give lip service to it, but all decisions are made in favor of shareholders. On top of that, the culture really preaches metrics. We're going to run companies according to metrics. We're only going to manage to the things we can measure. And that, those are two things when you put them together that essentially make ethics irrelevant. Because with ethics, you're essentially saying, I'm willing to compromise a number or I'm willing to compromise my shareholder in pursuit of some larger goal or some larger value. And essentially, the business community has no space for that these days. And that's the world that Facebook was operating in. So in that sense, I... I cut them a lot of slack because how, how do you fight a business culture as pervasive as that when it so demonstrably works in your favor? And I think that's where they wound up. To me, where it gets really bad, and the part I can't forgive them for, is when the evidence came out in the fall of 2017 that the Russians had reached 126 million Facebook users registered voters in the U.S., and 20 million registered voters on Instagram with messages designed to manipulate democracy. Once that evidence was out there, Facebook should have capitulated and adopted the Johnson & Johnson Tylenol defense. And they did not. And I cannot understand why not. Because all of what's happening now could have been avoided I want to touch upon a, a sort of related point around, you mentioned manipulation, and, and this is, goes beyond data privacy here. You discuss these other issues you have with Facebook or maybe social media at large, you know, the, the dark side of technology, if you will. And you reference Stanford professor B.J. Fogg, author of Persuasive Technology, which I know some people have read. You know, who lays out the technology tricks used to manipulate us by exploiting the weakness in human psychology, such as the need for social approval. So peel that back for me. What is it that we seek that allows us to be so manipulated by this, this machine? So the thing to recognize is that it starts with a business model that actually is media. These companies are competing for our attention against television, against Netflix, against video games, the internet, all kinds of things. They need to get us. How do they do that? They use notification, which essentially appeals to this innate human desire for rewards. They then structure the notifications to appeal to our need for social validation and our desire for social reciprocity. So they send us a message that says, hey, you have been tagged in a photograph and you feel like, well, would you like to tag somebody else? Well, of course you would, because that's reciprocity, right? And, and so you see this loop that gets created. And the whole goal is to build a habit, to get people coming back and back and back. And pretty soon, 
for most of us, those habits tip over into some form of behavioral addiction where we find ourselves involuntarily reaching for the smartphone any idle moment. And, you know, people say, well, Roger, how do I know if I have a behavioral addiction? And I say, it's simple. When do you check your phone first thing in the morning? Is it before you pee or while you're peeing? Because for most of us, that is the entire spread of earliest and latest you check your phone. We're all addicted to one degree or another, which is to say we can't stop even if we know it's not good for us. And then once that's in place, then they have to get us to spend a lot of time because the ads flow by in newsfeed. So it's not enough to have us spend two minutes a day. They need us to spend 15, 20, 30, 40 minutes a day. How do they do that? They want to give us content that triggers basic human reactions, which is to say, once again, they appeal to the, the parts of the human psyche that are evolutionary, that they're, they're wired in like our flight or fight. But, but isn't that just good advertising, good marketing? It, it, well, the difference is it's now on a smartphone. So it's individually tailored. All advertising before these guys was a form of broadcast. And so the same techniques applied in a broadcast model are going to have much, much less effectiveness than, than when applied on a smartphone tailored to each individual person. So the key thing was when I wrote the book, I did not understand the full range of data that Google and Facebook have. And for that, I had to wait for this amazing book by Harvard scholar Shoshana Zuboff, professor at Harvard Business School, who wrote The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. She studied Google for 10 years. And the critical element is that Google evolved a business model based on behavioral prediction, gathering every possible piece of data about every human being, creating a data voodoo doll, and using that to predict human behavior, and then using the services that it offers, search and uh, you know, maps and ways and Pokemon Go and all these other things, in order to influence the behavior of people, and essentially to use that, that data voodoo doll and have that be reflected in search results. So we think we're dealing with an honest broker, right? We think we're dealing with the equivalent of encyclopedia, when in fact, we're dealing with somebody who knows everything there is to know about us and whose answers to our queries are tailored to maximize their economic benefit. That business model is incredibly manipulative. And Google is by far the best at it. It actually took Facebook until roughly 2014 before they really figured it out. But Google's been at this since ballpark 2002. You talk about this term, filter bubbles, that you know these these social media platforms and, and maybe Google and, and search engines lock us into these these bubbles. So I'm going to sort of define this from Wikipedia. Uh, it's a state of intellectual isolation resulting from personalized searches when a website algorithm selectively guesses what information a user would like to see based on information about the user. So essentially, it's an echo chamber where we see or hear stories that essentially reinforce our pre-existing beliefs. So I guess the question I have is, is that phenomenon all that new? Like, haven't we always consumed media, TV, radio, newspapers, magazines, you know, based on our values and our leanings? Absolutely. And there were clearly filter bubbles in the era of radio. The filter bubble on television when I was a child was absolute. And if you think about it, everyone my age witnessed the Kennedy funeral in 1963, the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show and the moon landing. And almost every living, breathing American witnessed all three of those events at exactly the same time. And the filter bubble it created brought the country together because we all saw the same things. In fact, the complaint at the time was about conformity, right? That was what the complaint was. Now, once you put it on a smartphone and you can tailor it to individuals, filter bubbles take on a more sinister air because at that point, you take a country that is already polarized and by reinforcing people's most extreme views, by essentially pushing, you know, the stuff that's going to most animate them is likely to going to be things that appeal to fear or outrage. And the reason is because those are universal and sharing those things makes us feel better. And so we do share them. 
So doing that means we're, we're, we're actually going to be exposed on social media far more often to hate speech, disinformation, and conspiracy theories than have people have ever been exposed to before. And the result is that each person gets locked into a unique information space, often with their own facts. And so the result is in the United States that every person has their own Truman Show. And globally on Facebook, it's almost two and a half billion Truman Shows. And in that situation, a polarized country loses the ability to have reasonable conversations. You know, that you wind up as we have today, roughly 40% of the population identifying with at least one thing that is demonstrably false, right? A third of the country will tell you they believe in their heart and soul that climate change is a hoax. Another six or seven percent will tell you that they believe in their heart and soul that there is a link between vaccinations and autism. Another two or three percent will tell you they believe the earth is flat. People believe all kinds of demonstrably untrue things because when you're inside social media, you can be surrounded by people who believe the same thing you do. And it's this very safe, comforting space that is resistant to fact. And, you know, again, it's not new, but it's been made much worse by social media because of the personalization. Uh, you mentioned the societal cost. I want to share a quote from the book. Technology has changed the way we engage with society. Substituting passive consumption of content and ideas for civic engagement. Digital communications for conversation. It has contributed to our conversation from citizens to consumers. Could you unpack that for me? Yeah. So my impression is that from 1933 until about, well, the early 50s, the United States was wholly committed to collective action. The country beat the Depression. It won the Second World War. And it approached the early days of the Cold War where people said, you know what? We're going to have high tax rates. We're going to invest in bringing up the standard of living of the average American. And it worked incredibly well. But in the period after the war, in the early 50s in particular, folks were tired. And so it became a big deal to create packaged goods that reduced the amount of work necessary to be a successful American. So suddenly the notion of having it your way starts to infiltrate the consumer packaged goods business. And between say 1950 and 2000, in those 50 years, we saw everything in the world of products go from mass market to mass customization. And everybody simply expected that they could have what they wanted when they wanted. At that point, they really were consumers. So when you were in this period of high taxes and you were fighting wars and fighting depression, obviously civic engagement was huge. Voting turnout was really high. And you had the evening news every night where in the days of radio and then the early days of television, there were no alternatives. You know, between 6 and 7 p.m., you had to watch the news so people were well informed. By 2000, suddenly the technology comes along to do the same thing in the world of ideas. And that's where it gets really scary because Google, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, suddenly get into a world of absolute relativism where there is no such thing as a fact. Everything is a matter of opinion. Everything is a matter of, of vote. You know, if it's trending, it's real. In that world, civic engagement goes to zero. I mean, what are you going to get engaged in? We have no common interests, right? We can't even talk to each other. Internet platforms have had a massive impact on that. I mean, the reality was the change from active citizenship to consumerism had been going on for 50 years before they showed up. But it was just about products. They took it into the world of ideas, and that is much worse. So, Roger, I'm curious why you've chosen to play such an active role with all of this. You could have simply, you know, shut down your Facebook account, pulled out your investment, maybe you already had pulled it out and, and just be done with it, walk away. You've retired anyway, sell off into the sunset. You've certainly earned the right. You know, what's in it for you? Because I'm assuming you've taken some flack. People in that world, in technology, in the valley, aren't thrilled about really essentially holding a mirror to themselves and exposing a lot of this. So why did you sort of go this path? I wrote the book as a platform for activism, knowing that the story would not only not be done 
at the end of the book, but that it might just be beginning. And so a book came out and I've spent the last 16 weeks, seven days a week, mostly on the road, uh, speaking to people and engaging in all manner of conversations. And it has been by turns the single most disappointing thing I've ever done, but also something where I've had two benefits. One is that I do feel as though I am making a difference. And secondly, I have gotten engaged face to face with people that I haven't talked to in years, including people who had a really important role in my life earlier on. I've made eye contact in ways I did. I, I realized that I had allowed technology to mediate my life almost entirely and that I had more or less stopped having the kind of personal interaction that makes life really rich and fulfilling. And this experience has given me a really good object lesson of why human interaction is really the best you can get out of life. So with all this news out there, the abuse of power, the misuse of our data, the ultimate breach of consumer trust, why do you suppose there hasn't been a massive revolt? Like why aren't 2 billion Facebook users closing their accounts? Do people not care or is the addiction that strong that we just can't give it up? I think the addiction is incredibly strong. I also believe that the issues are very complicated, very nuanced, and the storytelling is ongoing. The other thing that's hard is that the connection between use of these products and all these problems is very hard to see because the companies have done an amazing job obscuring what they're really doing. We all think we're giving up a little personal data in exchange for a really valuable or a really fun service. And we're definitely getting a valuable or fun service, but the data we're giving up to them is not what we're talking about. Google and Facebook gather data every possible way. The stuff you put in is maybe one-tenth of 1% of what they have about you. Most of what they get about you, they get from tracking you on the web, buying data from your bank, your credit card processors, from your cellular carrier, for your location, every application on the web that will sell it, every business, you know, like CVS that has affinity cards, they'll all sell their data. They gather data from surveillance applications like Alexa or Google Assistant. They also have, uh, in the case of Google and I think Microsoft, the ability to scan emails or documents. So th they have this really high resolution from Doodle. And it turns out, they don't need you to use their product in order to gather data. They need you to use the product in order for them to manipulate your behavior. And that's the part that's really hard for people to understand because that's never happened before. It's so new. It's, it's basically like the matrix. And, you know, people have seen the movie, but they look around them and they don't see people wearing funny suits, right? They, they see people look very normal. It's super hard to see the connection between their use of the apps and all the bad stuff that's going on. But the connection is not only real, it's getting a lot worse as Google does projects like Pokemon Go or like uh, Sidewalk Labs, which is its smart cities program, where they really are implementing a vision of replacing democracy with algorithmic decision-making. And that's something we all ought to have a conversation about. And again, I'm not saying to people you should give up the products. What I'm saying is let's engage in this conversation. Let's decide, do we want to live in a world where we replace democracy with algorithms that may make the world more efficient, but at the cost of the choices we would normally like to make for our own selves? Do you regret investing in Facebook? I don't, but I reserve the right to change that point of view eventually. The Facebook I invested in was not what we're looking at today. When I stopped being a close advisor to Mark and Show in 2009, they were still roughly five years away from implementing the business model that we're talking about here. The advice I gave to Mark in 2009 was don't go for maximum scale. Keep the thing really pure. Keep the thing really clean. Keep it something you're incredibly proud of. And the thing I hope to this day, if I could sit down with Mark today, I would say, Mark, you can still be the hero in your own story. I try to explain to him that he can do more good by reforming the business model of Facebook than he can do with a thousand Chan Zuckerberg initiatives or any other foundation.
So I usually like to conclude with this question. The name of this podcast is The Art of Excellence. What's your definition of excellence? Excellence is an outcome that reflects mastery of an activity at a time and in a place. So you can have excellence being absolute, but excellence can also be something that is specific to a situation. And there's a, as you know, a famous aphorism that says, don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. And one of the things that I believe about excellence is that something that can be excellent in one situation is worthy of praise. And the fact that it's not excellent in all situations isn't necessarily an argument against doing it. Roger, we will end with that. I love that answer. I really appreciate your, your sharing your story. Um, there's a lot more to it, but I, I found the book fascinating. Definitely I recommend it to everyone listening. And thank you so much for being part of the show. My pleasure. Thank you. Hey, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. You can subscribe to the show at iTunes, Stitcher, and theartofexcellence.com. I've got one small favor to ask. If you like the show, please take a minute and leave us a review on iTunes. I would really appreciate that. I'll see you next time. Thank you.